Hello, and welcome to Archival Adventures for October 20th, 2001. I'm Anthony Wright de Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech, and I am your guide today. Uh, before I jump in, I do uh, just want to read off the land and labor acknowledgements for the university, um, and then we will be looking for some terrifying tales today. So, um, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to ut prosim that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. So I like to read that because I think it is important to keep in mind and I want to uh, encourage as many people as possible to hold the university accountable to those words uh, because that is their commitment and so we should make sure that they're living up to it. Um, let me say hello to people. Uh, hi, Key Squared. Hi, was not worth it. Welcome, welcome. Hi, Fluidan. Hi, Hannah. Welcome, 16-bit Eric. Thank you for bringing 66 people over from the Whimsies. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome, Whimsies, to Archival Adventures. Um, you probably know me best as Rogan27, which is the channel that you rated in on. Um, I am Anthony Wright de Hernandez, the Community Collections Archivist at Virginia Tech. And on this show, I share materials from the archive. Um, <laughs> hi, Ralph Exiv. Hi, Chandra. Hi, Crafty Becky. Hi, Orangitis. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I don't have a lovely bridge behind me today, <laughs> and I might sound a little bit echoey or hollow. Um, the space that I stream from has been going through changes. Be right, UK. Thank you for the 500 bits. Um, so uh, when I started the show, I was streaming in another room on the second floor of the library. That room is used and reservable by patrons. And so uh, we've been trying to transition to a new streaming space. Um, for a few weeks, I was in this room, but I had a lovely black curtain behind me and the room was full of other stuff. Um, last week, I wasn't here because they were painting this room. And painting is finished, but we don't have the sound panels up yet and we don't have so, so it was very institutionally bright in here when I got in here. Um, <clears throat> I've adjusted the lighting a little bit to kind of soften it a bit, but it's still not great. Uh, it'd be better with the backdrop, but you know, whatever. <laughs> yes, I do need a green screen, um, uh, Chandra. I, I have mentioned it and it is uh, definitely being looked into. Um, so the other space had a green, the whole wall was painted in chroma key green. Um, and I, had I known there would be no backdrop and that it would be this lovely white painted cinder block behind me, I have backdrop panels in gray and black and white that I could have brought upstairs with me, but I did not know until I got here. Uh, but you know, that's fine. I also, the table I usually stream at, has disappeared on me. Uh, I am at a much smaller table today. Uh, I'm gonna actually show you the table and because you know, you're gonna see part of it anyway. As I go to document focus, you'll note the table is now gray instead of the tan color that it has been. Um, there's also cord shadows and other things like that. If stuff becomes an issue, do mention it because if, if you all, if my viewers tell me that something is an issue, 
I can raise it and say, hey, the people watching the show were commenting on how this was a problem. Can we fix it? If nobody mentions that it's a problem, then me complaining that it's a problem won't lead to it getting fixed very quickly. <laughs> Anyway, welcome everybody in. The goal today is to look at some creepy things. I have Edgar Allan Poe that we will definitely be reading again at some point during the program. Um, the collection I decided to pull for us to start off with is the Western Lunatic Asylum of Staunton, Virginia. Um, it was a, let's see, we have materials dating from 1840 to 1903 from the Western Lunatic Asylum. So the theme this month has all been uh, kind of spooky or creepy things. We looked at some collections with human hair in them and discussed why there was human hair in the collections. Uh, we've looked at some pulp magazines that were focused on horror stories. Uh, we've read some British and American uh, poetry and fiction uh, that are in sort of that horror vein. Um, and so uh, we looked at some true crime for the local area. We looked at ghost stories for the local area around Virginia Tech. Uh, one of the things that we have not done so far is look at things that people typically find creepy uh, that were not intended to be so. And so the, we have the Western Lunatic Asylum papers. And when I read to you about the Western Lunatic Asylum, you're going to be like, yeah, that place creepy. Uh, but the materials that we have are not so creepy. But we're still going to look at them. Let's see how well this works. <laughs> the lighting was better in here before. Let's, let's just agree to that. Uh, Oh, let me turn on the document camera light and maybe that will help with the shadow. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe? Nope, doesn't really help. Asylums are always creepy and fascinating at the same time. Crafty Becky, uh, sure. I mean, yes. But let me read to you the description for the collection of materials that I have to start the stream with today. And actually, if, if anybody wants to read along, yes, the cable shadow helpfully lands right on the title either way. Um, I wish, I don't know. There used to be a power strip that I, it, things were plugged into below the table. And today things are plugged in to the table because the table has electrical outlets in it. Um, if I had a power strip to plug them into, I probably would do so. Also, one second. I'm going to get this done for you all. We're just going to switch where these things are plugged in. OK, that should take care of the, ca the cable shadow. Also uh, made it so I can no longer see my monitor, but that's OK. Um, <laughs> and part of the reason I did that was because I knocked off the power pack or the, the um, I knocked something off the table and it unplugged the computer. <laughs> Renovations giving us uh, fun times. Okay, we should be good now. <laughs> now that we've dealt with the cable, do we need to do something about the dead pool? Uh, Possibly. Also, um, it looks like my automated Moobot announcement about 
Ask an Archivist Day didn't go away because I forgot to remove it. Uh, but, you know, Ask an Archivist Day was last week, which is when the whole Twitter community of archivists was encouraging people to ask them questions. But on this stream, every week, if you have a question about archival practice and you want to ask it, go ahead. So I am I'm happy to answer those kinds of questions. Let me see if I can close that. There, OK. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> This is what streaming's all about, is adapting to the changes in, in set and technology from week to week. Uh, <laughs> this is why you know it's live. Hi, Scraff, how are you today? <laughs> all right, so <clears throat> we're starting off, like I said, with the Western Lunatic Asylum papers. Um, these are for the Western Lunatic Asylum in Staunton, Virginia. Um, and let me see, historical note from the finding aid. Oh yeah, that's what I was about to do, but when I distracted myself with fixing, um, I'm gonna drop the finding aid into chat for you in case you want to take a look at it and you see a folder that you particularly want me to make sure that I share. Um, I will drop that over here. I'm doing pretty good scrap. The, as you can see, uh, the set and stuff around me has changed. Audio quality might be different because the room is very echoey right now. The whole room was cleared out because uh, they were painting it last week. Um, and not much has moved back in. So I'm basically surrounded by four cinder block walls and it's very echoey and very bright because they're all painted white and we used to have like black curtains on the walls that would dim down the, the space and the stage lighting worked better. But other than that, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, OK, now that I have shared the finding aid. <laughs> you broke out of there. Wait, you broke. Oh, no, you broke out of the Western Lunatic Asylum in 63. Oh, dear. Uh, OK, originally called the Western State Lunatic Asylum, the Western Lunatic Asylum was a hospital for the mentally ill in Staunton, Virginia, opening in 1828. In its early years, the institution was a resort-style asylum directed under Dr. Francis T. Stribling. Dr. Stribling promoted a clean, healthy, and kind atmosphere that would aid in the healing process of his patients. While Dr. Stribling was the director of the hospital, uh, patients were well cared for and treated with, with respect. Um, oh. One second, this is, that's only part of the historical note. Interesting. I have shared an abridged version with you all, apparently. I, I will get you the, the correct finding aid in just a second, because uh, that's not the complete entry from what I was reading earlier. Ah, okay, so th that was the first paragraph of the administrative history note for this finding aid. Um, so this model of care, the resort style where everybody was treated with kindness and respect, vanished in the 1900s, replaced by the overcrowding and the warehousing of patients. Techniques such as physical restraints and straitjackets were then used. After the passage of the Eugenical Sterilization Act of 1924 in Virginia, patients at the Western Lunatic Asylum were sterilized, sometimes forcibly, under the authorization of Joseph Desjardins, a noted eugenicist. He was the director of the hospital from 1905 to 1943. Implementing much stricter and harsher practices than his predecessor, electroshock therapy and lobotomies were also practiced at the institution. The hospital moved to its present site off Interstate 81 at the property, and the property remained vacated until it was converted in the 1970s into the Staunton Correctional Center, a men's penitentiary. The prison closed in 2003, and the site was then left vacant again for several years. In 2005, the state of Virginia gave the property to the Staunton Industrial Authority, and the facility has now been converted into condominiums called the Villages at Staunton. 
So let me get you the proper finding aid that includes that entire history. As I've said, our, our finding aid resource, we've had um, some duplication and usually they're identical, but in this case, it seems like it's been updated since one set of data was pushed and it has not been fixed. <clears throat> so there is the proper one there and I'll drop the proper one in here. Um, but yeah, so it, it starts off this idyllic asylum, sort of like, uh, I'd say, what was depicted in, um, oh, hang on. Um, all right, name me some asylum movies, people, because my brain is forgetting. The Color of Water, is that, what's, how much do you want to bet that the building is haunted? Uh, Hannah, it certainly sounds like a place that would be haunted. Um, I certainly don't think I would want to live in a condominium there. Um, nope, not The Color of Water. Uh, I can't remember. Anyway. Oh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest is a possibility. That's not what I was thinking of. Um, I'm trying, to, I'm trying a quick Google search to refresh my memory and, and it's just not coming and I don't know. And, but cure for wellness, that's the one I was trying to think of. Um, so a, a kind of idyllic like resort style place where people would go and be cared for uh, lovingly. Um, and, and that's sort of like the initial depiction of the asylum in a cure for wellness. Um, but then, after the turn of the century, starting in 1904 or 05, when um, the administrator changed, it became what we expect to see in horror movies about lunatic asylums. Overcrowded, a uh, place to send people who were unwanted, whether or not they were mentally ill, um, people put in physical restraints and inside in straight jackets, uh, forced sterilizations, forced, um, uh, forced lobotomies, electroshock therapy, like those all happened at this asylum. But those all happened after this initial period where it was a, a caring facility. Um, I have lost. Uh, yeah, Shiny Marigold, The Shape of Water. So the materials that we actually have from this collection and just before everything turns sour, uh, what we have are correspondence written to the asylum dating from 1840 to 1870, as well as rep uh, annual reports from 1862 to 1903, um, the letters are addressed to the original director, uh, Francis Stribling, um, and they're written by family members of the patients, and they're asking about the care of their family members. Um, 
so we have stuff that goes up to just before everything turns into a horror movie, which I think is wonderful because I think even a well-run resort style asylum to most people today is creepy um, because you see this idyllic space and you're like, what's going on underneath? What's, what's really going on there? Because horror movies have, have taught us to look for that. And so what's really interesting to me with regard to this asylum in particular is it truly was a very nice place and well run until just after what we're going to look at when it became a living horror movie. Um, so <laughs> let's start with some of these annual reports and then we'll look at some of the letters. Um, and if, like I said, if there's something listed in the finding aid that you particularly want me to pull out and make sure that we see today, do let me know because I will prioritize that. So here we have document number nine. Report of the President and Directors of the Central Lunatic Asylum, fiscal year 1861 and 62. So this is the Central Lunatic Asylum, uh, which is interesting to me because the one that we have the papers for is the Western Lunatic Asylum. Uh, huh, okay. We have the officers, Thomas Michi, John Harmon, Samuel Brown. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here. Jacob Baylor, Kenton Harper, Michael Harmon, Absalom Coiner, John Imboden, Henderson Bell, Samuel Moffat, and James Taylor. Uh, W.H. Watts as clerk, Dr. Francis T. Stribling, the physician and superintendent. We have a William Hamilton and a T.V.L. Davis as assistant physicians. Uh, looks like Baylor was the treasurer. Samuel Woodward, steward, and Mrs. Eliza Tinsley as matron. It sounds like a cast of characters. Uh, at a meeting of the Board of Directors of the Central Lunatic Asylum held at Staunton, uh, 27th December, 1862, resolved that the president of the board be requested to forward the accompanying report to the directors, this day made and adopted to His Excellency the Governor of Virginia. Sir, in compliance with the above resolution of the Board of Directors of the Central Lunatic Asylum, I have the honor to enclose herewith the report of the Directors of the Year ending September 30th, 1862. Let's see what they say about the operation of this asylum. To the Governor of Virginia, the Board of Directors of the Central Lunatic Asylum of Virginia present this as their report for the year ending the 30th of September, 1862. They respectfully refer to their report for two years, ending 30th September 1861, and again suggest the modification of the law therein proposed. The board refers your excellency to the accompanying report of the physician and superintendent for such details of the condition and management of this institution as are required by law to be reported. Well, that said about absolutely nothing. From this report, it will appear that the support fund for the last year, including the board fund collected, has fallen considerably short of meeting expenditures, notwithstanding the supplies on hand at the commencement of the year, which have been bought, brought, in, uh, brought in aid of it and are now consumed. The board is therefore satisfied with the sum of $65,000 suggested in said report of their superintendent, with will rather fall short of than exceed the expenditures of the current year. We ask that the that that appropriation be made as the least with which the comfort of the asylum can be secured. And as an additional argument in favor of such increased appropriation, we refer to the prices of 1861-2 compared with the estimated prices for 1862-3 as exhibited in said superintendent's report. The board ask no other appropriation for the current year inasmuch as the transportation fund on hand 
uh, and unexpe unexpended is deemed ample for that service. So basically they said, we need more money. They had uh, 420 patients, 248 are identified as males, 172 are identified as females. Um, that was 40 more than the year before, so they admitted 40 additional people. And at year end, they had lost a couple, so they were down to 355. Am I reading that right? Interesting. 65 were discharged, including dead. 30 of them recovered. Four of them were much improved. Three of the patients identified as male were listed as improved. And one, one listed as male and one listed as female were noted as unimproved. Um, I believe that is a breakdown of the discharges. Oh, one of them was discharged because they eloped and 25 died. I want to know that story. One, one man in this asylum in this year was in the lunatic asylum because of mental illness and eloped and therefore was released from the asylum. That sounds like a story. That sounds, honestly, looking at this, it really feels like if I was a writer who wrote like uh, suspense fiction or something like that, I could take really good inspiration from this report. Um, the wedding cured him. Yes, Imsilica. <laughs> uh, nothing has occurred in connection with the operations of the institution of marked importance, nor anything in its daily current events calling for special notice at this time. The inmates have, by the blessing of a kind providence, enjoyed a good degree of physical health, and we have had to record no casualty of a serious character. It is gratifying to add that whilst anxiety, distress, and suffering have so extensively pervaded our country, many of the wards in this asylum have been the abode of a quiet and comfort somewhat ref refreshing to behold. So the last bit is just about how they're upset that their expenses outweighed their income for the year. Oh, this last bit is rather interesting, actually. <clears throat> Gotta love how they're basically saying, actually, our inmates are calmer than the people outside. Indeed, Snorp and Boss. And let's, let's look at this final, pair, uh, final section uh, and examine why they're saying that. The uncertainty as to how long our country will continue in its present distracted condition, and indeed as to whether peace would be speedily followed by a reduction of prices, renders it impractical or impracticable for us to designate any sum necessary to cover the reasonable and proper wants of the institution the present year. We can only hope to approximate when we suggest that your board ask an appropriation of $65,000 for support in addition to the uh, pay patient fund. <clears throat> Should this prove too little, the deficiency can be supplied by the su succeeding legislature. If too much, the whole need not be drawn from the treasury of the Commonwealth. Of the sum appropriated at the last... so. This, the, the relevant part of this is the very first sentence. The uncertainty as to how long our country will continue in its present distracted condition, and indeed as to whether peace would be speedily followed by a reduction of prices, renders it impracticable for us to designate any sum necessary to cover the reasonable and proper wants of the institution the present year. So 
what's going on outside this asylum? This is the annual report for the fiscal year 1861 to 1862. Do you know? And did they get peace outside the asylum relatively quickly? exactly was not worth it. Uh, <laughs> the American Civil War started in 1861. Um, so at the time of this report, uh, do we know what month the American Civil War began? I'm just going to Google because I don't know. OK, so this report was written in September, I believe. Or it was after. So the, the fiscal year ended in September. This report was following a vote of the board of directors in December of 1862. So this report. was uh, the 1861-1862 fiscal year. So starting in October of 1861 through September of 1862. And it would have been written probably in January of 1863. So at the time that this, I'm just trying to think of which government are they addressing? And indeed, uh, based on the dates, they would have been addressing the state, or the Virginia is a commonwealth, so the commonwealth government of Confederate Virginia would have been the, the government that they were writing to requesting funds. Um, <laughs> the famous novel Across Five Aprils. Yes, yeah, and, and uh, DJ Phoenix got it. A April 12th, 1861 was the official start. Um, so this was at least a year into, and about a, probably a year and a half into the Civil War um, when this report was written. And it sounds like they were staying pretty well out of it, other than that they needed the government to give them funding to keep operating the asylum. Um, but yeah, going into it, I didn't recognize that, yes, His Excellency the Governor of Virginia, but it would have been uh, the Governor of Confederate Virginia. Um, this was John Lecter, who was the Governor of Virginia, the Commonwealth member of the Confederate States of America. Um, at the time that that report was written. The next one that we have is the 76th annual report of the Board of Directors and of the Superintendent of the Western State Hospital of Virginia for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 1903. Same asylum, same hospital. It used to be the Central Lunatic Asylum. Now it's the Western State Hospital. Um, it's just had, had a name change. Um, and so this is jumping forward where this is the year ending 1903. It's still in operation. And this is before, this is like two years before the administration change that led to the straitjackets and lobotomies. Um, so. Let's see how things were just before things took a turn for the horror movie. At a meeting of the Special Board of Directors of the Western State Hospital, Staunton, Virginia, on October 21st, 1903, the annual report of the superintendent was read and approved, and it was ordered that the president of the board transmit the same to the governor of the Commonwealth. A copy attested uh, C.J. Armistead, Secretary of Special Board. 
So officers of the hospital at this time, uh, noted by where they are from in the state. So we have J.L. Threadway, who was president of the board of directors uh, from Chatham, S.H. Hansborough from Winchester, J.B.T. Thornton from Manassas, A.H. Snyder from Harrisonburg, J.W. Todd from Staunton, R.B. James from Danville, C.C. Conway from Orange, E.E. E. Stickley from Woodstock, and A.F. Withrow from Bath. And I know, unless you're from Virginia, you don't know where most of those places are, but uh, that's, they're distributed all across the state. Um, directors under new constitution, uh, J.L. Threadway, R.S. Turk, and S.H. Hansborough. So the resident officers, the people who are actually on site at the asylum, we have Benjamin Blackford, who was a doctor and superintendent, G.S. Walker, doctor and assistant physician, J.S. Desjardins, doctor and assistant physician, Chertsey Hopkins, doctor and assistant physician, C. Miller, steward, C.J. Armistead, secretary, and C. O'Connell, engineer. This J.S. Desjardins, uh, and I may, I may be eliding that a bit, uh, Desjardins, not certain exactly the pronunciation. Anyway, they are the person who takes over as administrator in 1905 and changes the policies and it's under their administration where the straight jackets and restraints and lobotomies and forced sterilizations take place. He is the eugenicist who takes over the hospital in 1905. Uh, and here he's just an assistant physician. To His Excellency A.J. Montague, Governor of Virginia. The Board of Directors of the Western State Hospital ask leave to submit herewith for your consideration the 76th Annual Report of the Superintendent of the Hospital for the fiscal year ending the 30th day of September 1903. The condition, management, and operations of the institution are shown in detail in the report of Superintendent Blackford. An inspection of the report will show that the hospital is in a good condition and that the large number of patients therein are well cared for and, with, and everything done for their relief and comfort. We take pleasure in testifying to the efficient and faithful manner in which the officers have discharged their responsible duties. Respectfully submitted, James L. Threadway, President Pro Tempore of Board of Directors of Western State Hospital. So I would be really curious, and I have not done the research because as you all know by now, uh, if you've seen this show more than once, I pull the collections, I share them with you, and 99% of the time I have not seen the materials before I am sharing them with you. I haven't gone first to do research, I'm pulling them, we're looking at them together for the first time. Um, and that is the case here. So I don't know if archival records of this institution exist for the period of 1905 until um, it ceased operati operation in... Whenever it stopped, I can't find the date right now. Um, but during the horror movie period of this asylum, I don't know if anybody has those records. Um, because they have to exist, or they had to exist. It doesn't mean they have to still exist, but that would be something that um, if I was really doing some research on this or was using this as an inspiration for, say, a fiction novel or a movie script or something like that, this is very fertile ground to write something like that that could be based in fact or like learning about the transition of how this once lovely, well-run asylum, when put under a eugenicist director, became our stereotypical image of a horror movie asylum. Uh, comparing these records, the, the things that 
we have here with things from that period immediately after uh, would be very important research to do. And so I haven't looked to see, um, in the movies, they were always lost in a fire. Uh, fun trivia, Wiki tells you that Montague was born in 1862, the same year as the last report. And, and now he's the governor of Virginia. That is, that is a fun fact. Um, I'm just going to do a quick Google. Just to see if any other archives in the state have. And indeed, um, it appears that the Library of Virginia also has records from this institution. They have admission registers from 1828 to 1941. Um. Ha! 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 Oh, sorry. I'm seeing their background. Let me read their background note. Uh, in January 1825, the Virginia General Assembly passed legislation providing for the construction of an asylum in the western part of the state. A court of directors was commissioned by the governor to serve as the asylum's governing body and charged with purchasing a site close to the town of Staunton, west of the Blue Ridge Mountains, on which to build an asylum to house the mentally ill of western Virginia. The institution, which became known as Western Lunatic Asylum, was the second mental health facility built in the Commonwealth of Virginia. The buildings and surrounding gardens were designed to embrace the idea of moral therapy for mentally ill patients by providing an aesthetically pleasing and tranquil atmosphere in which patients lived comfortably, exercised, and worked outdoors. Western Lunatic Asylum opened in 1828, accepting both male and female patients suffering from a variety of mental disorders. Common diagnoses included hard study, religious excitement, and debility of the nervous system. The asylum was overseen by a keeper, a matron, and a visiting physician during its earliest years. The hospital also employed attendants, gatekeepers, night watch personnel, farmhands, and a steward who handled the day-to-day -day financial operations. The first superintendent appointed to oversee Western Lunatic Asylum was Dr. Francis T. Stribling. Dr. Stribling was a proponent of the moral therapy approach and was a leader in the early mental health community. Dr. Stribling was one of the 13 founders of the Association of Medical Superintendents of American Institutions for the Insane, which later became known as the American Psychiatric Association. Dr. Stribling served as the hospital superintendent and as a physician until his death in 1874. It should be noted that the hospital underwent a short-lived name change between 1861 and 1865 during the Civil War, when it was known as Central Lunatic Asylum. It should not be confused with an asylum by the same name later built in Petersburg, Virginia to house African American patients. From 1865 to 1894, the name was again Western Lunatic Asylum. However, in 1894, the General Assembly passed legislation changing the name to Western State Hospital. Another highly influential superintendent at Western State Hospital was Dr. Joseph S. Desjarnet. Uh, Dr. Desjarnet was hired as a physician in 1889 and was appointed superintendent in 1905. His tenure was the longest of any superintendent at Western State. Dr. Desjarnet was also responsible for founding the Desjarnet State Sanatorium, which housed patients with the ability to pay for their treatment. Dr. Desjarnet remained the superintendent of Western State for 38 years, retiring in 1943 with many accolades. He served as superintendent of the sanatorium from its formation in 1932 to his full retirement in 1947. Dr. Desjarnet's involvement in the eugenics movement and his support of the involuntary sterilization of mental patients was in more recent years, or, er, has in more recent years earned him a less favorable reputation. 
Many of Western State Hospital's original structures remain standing on what is referred to as the old site. Many of these structures are historically and architecturally significant and are listed on the National Register of Historic Places. During the 1960s, a newer hospital facility was constructed and over the next decade, patients and programs were slowly, slowly moved to the new site. Deinstitutionalization efforts and increased focus on localized community programs resulted in lower pa patient census numbers starting in the 1970s, and by the mid-1970s, the old site had shut down completely. The old site was later converted into Staunton Correctional Center, which remained until its closure in late 2002. The original grounds of Western State Hospital were eventually sold and are being converted into condominiums and retail space as part of an urban development plan. Western State Hospital continues to serve the mental health needs of Virginia citizens from the new site in Staunton, Virginia. The hospital is part of the Virginia Department of Behavioral Health and Depar Developmental Services and is governed by the State Board of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services. Um, but yeah, so if somebody wanted materials from after the period that we have, uh, the Library of Virginia, which is the, the statewide library, has has archival material. Vacated the property in the 1970s when the hospital moved to its present near site near I-81. Original facility was then converted. Men's penitentiary closed into, yeah. So I just, I, I found it humorous and interesting that the name changed to Central Lunatic Asylum uh, only happened during the period when Virginia was a member of the um, Confederate States of America. So only during the period of secession from the United States did the name of the hospital change to Central Lunatic Asylum from Western Lunatic Asylum. Um, and then, of course, here this report is after it became Western State Hospital. So let's see if there's anything interesting in this report. <laughs> Trying to imagine what Staunton could possibly be central to. Um, I'm trying to think. I, I have an inability to visualize things in my head, so I'm doing a quick Google search so I can actually look at a map um, so that I can recall exactly where it is. I've driven by it many times. Okay, so it's like halfway between here and Winchester. It's It's central in the state of Virginia. If you're counting north to south, then it's in the center. But it's on the far western side of the state. Unless you're considering West Virginia to be part of Virginia, in which case it becomes central. I don't, I don't know if maybe that figured into their reasoning um, that they, because West Virginia seceded from Virginia when Virginia seceded from the U.S. So the state of West Virginia left Virginia and stayed with the Union. So if Virginia was trying to say that West Virginia wasn't a thing and was still part of Virginia, calling the asylum the Central Lunatic Asylum would imply that it is in the center of Virginia and that what we know as West Virginia was still part of Virginia. So the name change could have had political reasoning behind it to try and claim that West Virginia was still part of Virginia. Um, so yeah, kind of interesting there. I, that would be an interesting topic to kind of explore. Were there other name changes that happened during that period that imply a similar intent? What, what are, is there documentation of why that name change happened? 
um, or what the justifications were for it at the time. Um, but at a surface level, just looking at it and knowing what I know about Virginia history, it wouldn't surprise me if that name change was done to try and support a claim on West Virginia by Virginia. Um. <laughs> All right, let's see. So this is 1903, right? It is with pleasure and very gratifying to be able to report that the general health of the household has been remarkably good during the year. We have had no epidemic and comparatively few cases of physical sickness of any serious nature. The hygienic and sanitary condition of the respective wards are kept up to the highest standard of excellence. We cannot, however, boast of entire freedom from casualty during the year. We had, unfortunately, a case of suicide, a female who had suicidal mania, having made several attempts before admission and three attempts after admission to kill herself, and at last succeeded, which, which was made the subject of the coroner's inquiry and reported to the board of directors. Um, just as a note, if anybody needs it, um, do reach out. There is a, uh, um, so in the U.S. we have a national suicide prevention line. If you are having thoughts, do reach out to them. That number is, uh, 800-273-8255. Um, since that came up and I was not expecting it to come up, I didn't have a content warning ahead of it, so I wanted to make sure I throw that out there. Um, also, oh, thank you, I am Puddle Glum. 741741 is the crisis text line. If you don't want to speak to somebody on the telephone, you can text them at 741741. Um, and I don't know, I tried looking for an international resource, but I'm not sure. I will have to look for that for the future. If somebody knows of an international resource. I would be happy for you to share it. <clears throat> oh. Well, I've got... Kenya, Mauritius, Morocco, South Africa, Uganda, Zimbabwe. Oh, yeah, okay, so yeah. If anybody not in the US needs access, um, there is a list. Uh, sure. You should be able to post a link now, I am Puddle Glum. Thank you, I am Puddle Glum. So we've both got two lists there, uh, one on stompoutbullying.org, International Suicide Prevention Resource, and then from I am Puddle Glum, op opencounseling.com slash suicide dash hotlines. Um, if somebody wants me to drop that in on the VTL Studios chat, also I can do that. Um, whoop, 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 whoop because I'm not sure if I have mod support available to do that for me. So give me one second, I'm gonna drop it in because it is a serious topic and um, and since the topic came up and it is a potential trigger but I was not prepared for it, I wanted to throw those out there. Uh, do reach out if you need to. Um, and the reason I wanted an international resource is because Twitch is an international platform and there are viewers from places outside the US that I know view this program. So I wanted to get an international resource available for that. Um, ooh, some description of what life was like at the asylum two years before the eugenicist took over. Let's see. Increase of insanity. Necessity for additional hospital accommodations. 
in my annual reports for the last three or four years, I have urgently called the attention of the General Assembly of Virginia to the absolute necessity of providing additional accommodations for our unfortunate, insane fellow citizens who are now unprovided for throughout the state for want of room in the respective state hospitals, which are now crowded to their utmost capacity. The chronic congested condition of the several hospitals of the state is not, in my judgment, conducive to the proper classification, care, and treatment of the inmates, nor to the hygienic or sanitary condition of the respective wards of each hospital. The vacancies created by deaths and discharges are not equal to the demands for admission, and it is only by the most liberal application of the parole system that we can receive new patients, allowing a very close margin of vacant beds for returning furloughed patients, and keep the jails free of insane and keep the jails free of insane persons, which is a most unsatisfactory way of keeping up vacancies, causing unavoidable delay in admissions. It is with some degree of reluctance that I refer to this subject again in this annual report, but so thoroughly convinced am I that the time has arrived when Virginia will be compelled to fall in line with her sister states and build another hospital for the insane or add greatly to the capacity of existing hospitals that I deem it my duty to refer to it again. And um, just because the language being used here is using that uh, the word insane multiple times, I'm just going to remind people this is a historic document, and um, we're presenting it as is. Uh, so that is not necessarily a term, term that we want in common use today. Uh, we understand mental health a lot better now, um, and there are much more respectful terms that can be used. It is a condition and not a theory that is confronting the taxpayer and the General Assembly of Virginia. Statistics show a large increase in insanity each year, and the cry in nearly all states is for more room and enlargement of the hospitals for the insane. The number of insane in the United States in 1860 was 24,042. In 1870, 27,448. In 1880, 91,997. In 1890, 106,254. In 1860, the percentage of increase to the whole population was native 1 to 1,569, foreign born 1 to 270. In 1890, native 1 to 828, foreign born 1 to, 8, er, 1 to 262. In the dense communities of the large cities of the eastern states, the ratio of insanity is about 1 to 340. While in the sparsely settled districts of the west and south, the ratio does not exceed 1 to 500 of the inhabitants. As modern conditions of health and disease are much the same in all civilized countries, it may be safe to accept the statistics of England, where a thorough system of registration has long existed and in a great part applicable to ourselves. Uh, the last annual report, 1902, of the Lunacy Commissioners shows an enormous increase in insanity in England and Wales. In 1859, the number of insane was 36,762, or 1 in 536 of the population. There has been a steady increase from that time up to January 1st, 1903, when the number of insane was 113,964, or 1 in 293 of the population. The rate of increase since 1894 has been specially notable. The, ref the report further says there was never such an increase in the number of insane as in the year ending December 31st, 1902, the increase over previous years being 3,251. 3, the number of persons who lost their minds in 1902 alone was 22,581, or almost 500 a week. The inc Sorry, I can't keep reading it. I try to take on, like, I am, I, I try to act the role, but that broke me. The, the number of persons who lost their minds in 1902 was 22,581, or almost 500 a week. That is a very definite statement for something that I don't think can be described in such definite terms. Um, not much better now. The wait list for admission to a Pennsylvania State Hospital actually was not worth it. Um, there is a shortage of mental health services worldwide right now and a record number of people seeking mental health assistance um, because 
the extended period of social isolation that happened over the last 18 months related to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, otherwise known as COVID-19, um, caused a lot of people's uh, particular mental idiosyncrasies to intensify or become impairing in some way. Um, so lots of people, as the world has started to open up more and more, um, and people have been trying to return to a, a routine that is more similar to pre-pandemic activity, um, have discovered some challenges with that. And so people are seeking assistance from mental health services. Um, and so that has led to a significant backlog in the availability of mental health services because the infrastructure was not ready to support the influx of patients that followed the extended period of uh, quarantine and isolation. <laughs> yeah, I'm calling shenanigans on the significant digits in that number of people who, who lost their minds. Yeah, um, what does it mean? Like there, there's a definitional gap here. The way that this is written, uh, he definite, definitively says that 22,000 some people lost their minds in the last year. Um, what exactly does it mean for someone to lose their mind? And how, do you, how did you document that 22,000 of them did so? Uh, it sounds to me, based on the narrative so far, the only justifiable statement would be to say that 22,000, uh, what was the number? It doesn't matter. Uh, 22,581 people were admitted to mental hospitals in the last year. Not that 22,581 people lost their minds but that 22,581 people were admitted to mental institutions in the last year. That seems justifiable based on the evidence presented, but claiming that they lost their minds, that seems like hyperbole. <laughs> you see streamers who play horror games on Twitch lose their minds on a weekly basis. Yeah, an issue of precision in speech. And it may well be that because this was written for the governor of Virginia and it was written by representatives of a mental institution in the, like it may be using colorful language to make an argument uh, and to convince a specific person um, or to convince the Virginia legislature and maybe this terminology was considered useful in making that argument. We don't really know. There's also a, an, an issue of how mental illness was viewed and believed to be caused at the time. Exactly, at Snorp and Boss, yeah. Um, let's see. I just lost their minds. Okay, the increase was found almost entirely among the poorer classes. Amazing. Amazing how most of the people losing their minds in 1902 were people below the median income. <laughs> you have to, yes, you have to consider who wrote it and uh, why and for whom they were writing it. You're six or seven years removed from having a loved one requiring the system, so it's still pretty close to home. Same problems, overcrowding and budget. Uh, yes, yes, they have definitely always existed. And if you go back into, um, uh, like the history of the Bedlam Institution in London, you'll find the same thing, overcrowding and lack of funding for Bedlam. And um, documented histories of Bedlam, I, I mean, the word, the name of that institution became a word for insane pan pandemonium or like um, chaotic pandemonium, sorry. I. Uh, With Bedlam, they had an overseer, but otherwise they just tossed people in and let them self-govern themselves within the walls of that institution. 
And so you had people who were sent there because they couldn't pay their bills, and so they were thrown into Bedlam as insane. You had people who definitely were not insane, who were uh, thrown in there for whatever justification somebody could get to stick. But then you also had people who were genuinely mentally disturbed mixing with them, and they were just basically running their own society within the walls of, of Bedlam Asylum. Um, but because large portions of that population did not have command of their mental faculties, it was a chaotic environment and uh, led to the term bedlam having the meaning that we use today. Um, but yeah, even going that far back, institutions like this were underfunded and overcrowded. I'm not certain of that, Snorpin Bass. I do, I have seen, um, I have seen claims that the original name of Bedlam was a corruption of the word Bethlehem, but I don't know, I've not researched to find out if that is accurate or not. Um... The increase was found almost entirely among the poorer classes, and evidence that the strain of poverty constitutes no small factor among the causes of insanity. The increase of insanity is not due to any one cause, but to a variety of causes operating in different directions. It is the opinion of some high authorities that insanity is essentially a disease that thrives most luxuriantly in the cities, but that is not for our observation in Virginia. It prevails mostly among the poorer classes of the rural districts. The carefully compiled tables of the Lunacy Commissions of England explain as far as possible the causes of insanity. The list is headed by drink, to which 23% of males and 96 of females among the cases of insanity are attributed. <clears throat> Heredity accounts for the greatest number of women, women lunatics, the proportion being the high one of 248 uh, Previous, previous attacks come next with 23.1% of women and 16.2% of men. In cases of unknown causes, men come first with 17% and women follow with 15.4%. The report further states the general impression that the increase of lunacy is due to the mental wear and tear of modern life is not supported by the figures. Adverse circumstances, including business anxieties and pecuniary difficulties, account for the lunacy of 6.2% of the men and 3.8% of the women. Mental anxiety, worry, and overwork, 5.7% of the men and 5.9% of the women. Love affairs, 1 in 200 of the men and 3 in 200 of the women. The question is often asked, is insanity on the increase? But it is not one that does not find accurate solution owing to insufficient data. But it is one that does not find accurate solution owing to insufficient data. From the best information that from statistics at hand, both in the United States and in England, and from our own limited experience and observation, we must conclude it is probably true that there is still an increase of insanity. And yet, Per contra, when we recall the fact that by far the larger number of the insane come from the poorer classes of the population, and that this must vary from one period to another according to existing social conditions, such as to produce anxiety, worry, uncertainty, and poor food, and further also the fact that there has probably never been a period of eight or ten years during which those who were willing to work could do so, and with higher wages than have ex existed he uh, heretofore, and that general prosperity has increased all along the lines during that time, it would seem that the probability of such increase would fade away. Therefore, are we, we are forced to the conclusion that there are more people in the state to become insane, and the usual causes of insanity ne have never existed in a less degree than during the last 10 years, while the actual numbers of the insane have largely increased. Europe's oldest asylum was the precursor of today's Bethlehem Royal Hospital in London, known as, the, as Bedlam, which began admitting the mentally ill in 1403. Thank you, Fluidan. Was, it, yeah, I mean, that tracks with what I know of Bedlam. 
alcohol is really more of a symptom since alcohol is likely for self-medicating. Yes, alcoholism in and of itself can cause various forms of illness. And, and yes, I am puddle glum. Are more people having mental health issues or are more people getting treated for mental health issues? Uh, I find it interesting that his argument here is ultimately to say that there are not more people becoming insane. He says, from his observations, it is not because more people are becoming insane, but rather that there are more people and therefore the number of people who are insane is larger because the population of Virginia is larger, therefore uh, the, the number of people who are becoming insane has also increased. That is essentially his argument here. Um, again, our hospital accommodations have not kept up parapasu, paripasu. I do not know what paripasu means. Um, P-A-R-R-I-P-A-S-U, or P-A-R-I-P-A-S-S-U. Equal footing. It's a Latin phrase meaning equal footing. It is not one I had encountered before. Uh, the accretions of chronic and incurable insane become as it were permanent. The insane patients live longer than formerly, formerly from the nature of their treatment. Instead of being neglected in jails and poorhouses, they are more humanely treated, carefully and comfortably housed, furnished a general and liberal dietary uh, every need attended to, in fact, everything done to make them happy so that longe longevity of life is promoted and the death rate diminished. This accretion referred to in the existing hospitals is another strong factor for the necessity of enlarging our state hospitals and should be seriously considered by the Generali General Assembly of Virginia. So building that argument for why they need more money. Improvements and repairs, more land for farming and gardening purposes, matron and pharmacist, fire insurance, farm and garden, electric light and power and telephone system. And then we get statistical tables. I really got stuck on this uh, annual report of the Western Lunatic Asylum. <laughs> it's very interesting to me. I should pull out a letter or two, and then we definitely are going to do an Edgar Allan Poe story today. Um, if somebody has a specific story that you want me to read, let me know. Um, I think somebody had mentioned The Raven last week. I also don't know if I will be able to actually read any of these letters. Because they are handwritten. Telltale heart. Okay. All right, let's see. Let's try and read out one of these letters so we can see what letters are like. These are all in these little envelopes. Ooh, yay, this one has a transcription. <laughs> a cask of Montelado. Uh, I can certainly attempt that. All right, ooh, here is this, this letter. Um, It appears that this was uh, using a sheet of paper as an envelope. So somebody had folded this paper up to be the envelope and then it had a seal on it at some time. Um, addressed to Dr. Francis Stribling, Staunton, Augusta County, Virginia. We do still have the remnants of the, the wax seal here on the back. 
and you all get to look at the, uh, the lovely handwritten document, um, but somebody in processing the collection has actually typed up the text. So I'll be able to read. <laughs> If you remember correctly, the envelope being the letter itself was, yes, actual en envelopes were a sign of having oodles of cash to waste. Yeah, I don't know what we're going to get. Was well, not worth it. My dear sir, a long time having elapsed since I have communicated with you the tribulation to my brother's case as he having been an inmate of your institution nearly a year, I now, actually, hang on. I'm interrupting myself, I apologize. I'm trying to zoom out as far as I can, get as much of the letter on screen for you as possible, because since I'm not looking at the letter, I'm not gonna know exactly when I need to switch or shift it. It is, sorry, it is na dated, um, so in the upper right, it says Charlestown, October 15th, 1840. My dear sir, a long time having elapsed since I have communicated with you the tribulation to my brother's case, and he having been an inmate of your institution nearly a year, I now address you on the subject and hope that the length of time he has been with you may have enabled you to form an opinion as to his final restoration or otherwise, and that you will, my dear sir, advise me of your judgment in the matter, favorable or unfavorable. I am one of those who would rather know the worst than be kept in a state of suspense and uncertainty. And if your opinion should be flattering to our hopes, I can have the satisfaction of communicating the intelligence to his mother and friends. Or if the reverse, I can bear the misfortune in silence, bowing in submission to him who does not willingly afflict the sons of men. Accept, dear sir, the warmest assurances of regard and esteem, William N. Craighill. So, asking the doctor to please tell him uh, whether his brother will ever recover, uh, and that if if it is affirmative, if his brother is likely to recover, he will happily report that back to his family. But if his brother is unlikely to recover, he will bear that in silence and not share it with the others. But he absolutely must know himself. It would be interesting if we had the uh, patient records to know what the final outcome was for Mr. Craighill's brother. Fun fact, your hometown was named after Carl the Ninth of Sweden, who founded it to be a port overlooking the southeastern Baltic Sea, which means it's basically Charles Crown in English. Interesting. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to read that one today. <laughs> you, you can glance at it, but without a transcription, there's no way I'm making that out with any reasonable time frame. Uh, I'm trying to find ones that will be relatively quick because Poe is lengthy. Oh. I think I might be able to read this one. Let's see, shall we? You can see it's got a little bit of water damage to it. Um, it's one large piece of paper one side of it was the envelope addressed to Dr. Stribling in Staunton, Virginia, stamped July 27th in Richmond, Virginia. Someone has penciled in down here, 1843. Um, 
It's one of the younger towns of the region, only 340 years old. <laughs> yeah, European time scale for what is old um, is very different than American time scale for what is old. <laughs> Richmond, July 27th, 1843. My dear doctor, I failed to write you last week as I intended to do, and you must... Uh, You must regard this as only an apology for not having done so. My uh, my something on this occasion. I'm not certain what it says. My something on this occasion P A Smiley A good fellow handles a hand spike much better than a goose girl. There's some vernacular happening here that I am unfamiliar with. And I, I, I have it now. My amanuensis on this occasion, R.A. Smiley, a good fellow, handles a hand spike much better than a, I think it says goose girl. But essentially, the person who's writing this for him handles a hand spike, uh, a, a pen, uh, much better than it. I, I don't know what a goose girl is, but um, I can imagine. I, I, I think it must be slang for a, a secretary, as in a, a, a young woman who you'd give a goose to, or uh, possibly referring to a quill. I'm, I'm not certain. It's not a term that I have encountered before, but that does appear to be what it says. Um, added to which, I am in truth too sick to dictate a letter. I am still too weak to set out for Philadelphia, whither I am uh, whither I am aiming to, or at, curious to go before I surrender all hopes of recovery. It afflicts me deeply, my dear sir, to hear of your bad health. God grant that you may be speedily restored. Tell my poor wife I will try and write to her again in a few days. The... anxious and hourly solitude which I feel on her account has a sad influence upon my mind and body. O oh, my friend, take care of my poor afflicted wife and and it's so they crossed out here, but it also sort of crossed out this word. Um, something, kindness, every effort to restore her to health. Uh, and to her friends, may God reward you with his richest blessings. You can read my letter, no doubt, and no apology in no apology is necessary 
I am propped up in bed. Truly yours, uh, looks like JMD. Goose Feather Quill does sound right. So it's, ah, much better than a goose quill. Yes, yes, that seems better than Goose Girl. Um, <laughs> and, and yes, it does look like a Q now instead of a G. My brain processed it as a G and I was just like, wow, that's a vernacular I'm not familiar with. Uh, but no, it is indeed Goose Quill. I must have just gotten distracted by the fact that it was a goose. Ah, Scruff, as an archivist, do I restore things? Um, <laughs> uh, so there are restorers who restore things. Um, archivists generally are not restorers. So if, if an object, if an item needs restoration, we would generally contract out and send it to a professional who does that. Um, our main job is to describe and make available. So the archivist um, organizes material, uh, writes up description of what exists, what is there, so that people are able to find it. But if an item needs actual restoration work, um, there are specialists who do that. Um, we might do some small things, uh, like say there's some, um, some minor mold damage or something like that if we have the, an appropriate facility to do so. Um, doing mold remediations or things like that, um, water damage restoration, stuff like that, uh, are possibilities for things that, depending on the archives, might be done, with it or done in house by an employee of the archives who may or may not be an archivist. Um, our facility here, we don't have any of that. We do not have the facilities or capability here to do that type of restoration. So any, like, uh, we have a small budget for such things and um, send out one or two pieces at a time to undergo restoration. Um, as far as like reading it and transcribing it and things like that, most of that that ends up happening um, if we need something transcribed, it's usually our student employees that end up doing that with our support um, because often we just don't have time. Uh, so in looking at this, like this one was handwriting that was easier for me to read, but I still managed to get that quill word incorrect, which is why usually you transcribe it and then you have somebody else read it to make sure that they're reading it the same as you did. Um, and even then you can still, mistakes can make it through uh, that somebody will catch at some point. But uh, we do our best. And transcription is one method in which an archivist might endeavor to um, make things more accessible so that people can find uh, specific content or access content easier. Um, especially with um, like a lot of the college students today so I'm at a I'm at a university um, the archive here is located at a university a lot of college students today have never learned cursive they've never learned handwriting they can they can handwrite by printing letters um, but script like this they've never been taught because most of what they've done their entire life is type on a keyboard. Um, because they've been around, like they've been using computers since kindergarten or even before. In fact, a lot of them have been using um, touchscreen devices like tablet computers, like iPads and iPhones since they were born. Um, and so we have a lot of students who've never seen or never had to learn this type of writing. Uh, so even, like for me, I learned cursive. But me, even looking at this, the handwriting here is stylistically different from what I learned and therefore hard to read. 
Uh, it's not just a matter of this person's handwriting is difficult to read, but the way letters were formed in actually handwriting documents was different. Um, here, a lot of the letters have the same forms, but this was a much more common handwriting for the period where a lot of the letters are just lumps. And it's a string of just little hills. And you have to figure out what letters they intended by the occasional um, letter that has a tall beginning or a tail uh, to figure out what the word is, um, which is much more difficult. <laughs> We do store in acid-free boxes and acid-free folders, yes. Um, so like this is, this is one of our, our folders. It's an um, acid-free folder. Most of our boxes here come from Hollinger, uh, which is one of the archival product suppliers. Um, the boxes and folders are acid-free. We'll, if we have particularly acidic items, um, so like construction paper, is very, very acidic. Um, we will uh, sequester those items either in their own folder or we'll put uh, slips of like acid-free tissue paper between the construction paper and other items so that they don't damage other things. Newspaper is also really acidic. Um, for more modern collections, like say 1970s and onward that have news, newsprint in them, we'll often just photocopy the newspaper if we're planning to keep it in because newspapers are archived in their own places and you can go to the newspaper itself and get a copy of that. Um, or especially if the news article uh, was published online um, and we have a newsprint copy of it, rather than sticking the newsprint in the collection, we'll just make a photocopy of it and stick in photocopy paper. So the text is retained, but we're not dealing with the acidic paper itself. For older newsprint, we definitely keep the newsprint, but newsprint becomes a, a big problem. It starts to deteriorate over time, and eventually with newsprint, we'll probably make a photocopy of it anyway, because over time the newsprint will deteriorate and fall apart and we'll still have the photocopy so that we still have the content of the newspaper. I don't know of any, um, I, I don't know for sure of any like pens that are in our collections. I know um, a couple weeks back when I pulled some diaries and stuff, at least one of them had uh, like a small pen that was part of the diary that was with it. But um, again, we don't really collect objects. We collect mostly documents. Uh, Hannah, yeah, we're, our role is similar to that of a museum curator um, in, in what we do. Uh, we're more the organization and, and documentation of material. Um, description of material than um, like a restorer, that is a very particular craft. Um, so not really document related, but I, I haven't seen one document wise on YouTube, but um, if you want to see some really cool YouTube videos of somebody doing restoration work and kind of get a sense of what is involved in restoration work, the level of intensity and the level of detail in rest restoration work is going to be similar. Uh, but if you go, there's a channel, um, a YouTube channel, Baumgartner Restoration, um, and he does videos of him. He's an art restoration person, so he restores fine art, paintings, things like that. Um, and it's, they're very, very good videos, but like the level of detail and the level of complexity and art that goes into his restoration work would be similar for document restoration. Um, it would still be that, that level of expertise and learning and, and craft that is needed to do document restoration, which is why just archivists generally are not, we're trained to do other things. We're not trained for that type of work. 
Um, <laughs> Scruff, yes, this is the, uh, the 1902, um, <laughs> This is the 1902 Arnhem edition of Edgar Allan Poe. It's the complete works of Edgar Allan Poe. Um, I'm looking to see, I, I, I need to find the stories that were requested. So one second. <laughs> I don't know which volumes they're in. Annabelle Lee. Um, I'm not familiar with that one, but I will definitely look. Also, Goose Girl is a thing in terms of 1843, the grim fairy tale with the same name was published just in 1815. It took on different meanings later. Uh, yes, cardboard is very acidic, crafty Becky. More common term was gossard. Gossard, gossard. So this is the complete tales. So I should be able to find Annabelle Lee um, the others that were requested were Telltale Heart and Cask of Amontillado. Um, the one I'm least familiar with is Annabelle Lee, so I will try and do that one first, and then I will look for the others. Annabelle Lee is on page 141 of the book that I currently hold in my hand, so, and it is a short one. Um, also, there's an illustration with Annabelle Lee. <laughs> Ooh, the National Museum has a really good YouTube channel that covers some restoration and preservation. The Masquerade of the Red Death. National Gallery in London, not the National Museum. Uh, yes, these, this is from our rare books collection. Um, so this is the 1902 uh, Arnhem edition, and they were um, signed in numbered sets. So this is number 418. Um, here we have Annabelle Lee. And so all the night tide, I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride, in her sepulcher there by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea. That is the caption that goes with this illustration by... Uh, looks like T.S. Coburn from 1902. Lesser known Poe is always the place to start. Yeah, that was that was my thinking. Um, and just because I have mentioned it, I'm going to throw this link in chat. Uh, I will drop it in both chats because I mentioned it. Um, They really are quite good videos, and so I feel no qualms about recommending Baumgartner restoration if anybody is interested in learning a little bit about art restoration or seeing the process done. He has um, atmospheric videos where there's no narration and it's just him doing it uh, with some like uh, music. Um, and he also has explanatory ones where he walks you through the process and explains why he's doing what he's doing. Um, and there's usually a before and after. Ah, Hannah, thank you for sharing that link on the Discord. All right, Annabelle Lee by Edgar Allan Poe and bore her away from me to shut her up in a sepulcher in this kingdom by the sea. The angels, not half so happy in heaven, went envying her and me. Yes, that was the reason, as all men know, in this kingdom by the sea, that the wind came out of the cloud by night, chilling and killing my Annabelle Lee. But our love it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we. And neither the angels in heaven above nor the demons down under the sea can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of, a, of the beautiful Annabelle Lee, and the stars never rise, but I feel the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. 
And so all the night tide I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride, in the sepulchre there by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea. And there's the illustration. Um, so it, there's a vague hint of a body here, a person kneeling, and a ghost in the illustration. I had not read that one before. Um, I'm not sure how many Poe books we have. I think, so we have this set, we have uh, the Bells, we have selections from Marginalia. I'm not sure that we have much more than that. Um, I think it's primarily just this set. Uh, the author that we have the most for is Sherwood Anderson. Um, like we, have, we have a lot of Sherwood Anderson. Uh, but we have Poe because he's prominent. Uh, but probably no more than like a library shelf worth of Poe in our, our collection. Um, and these really are the standout piece that we have of his, um, is this, this special run of the complete works from 1902. Um, let's see, Cask of Amontillado, Amontillado, Amontillado. I'm not sure how to say that and I'm gonna, I'm going to settle on one and we'll go with it. Let's see if I can find it. MS. Found in a bottle. Bernice Morella lionizing the unparalleled adventure of one Hans Fall. The assignation. Bonbon. Bon, shadow a parable. King Pest. Loss of breath. Metzengerstein. The, the Duke de l'Omelette. Um, not in that one. <laughs> um, we have a number of books that have, um, like illuminated manuscript type things. We have a few of those. Yeah. I would have to look. Our oldest stuff is from the 1400s, and we only have a couple of things that old. Um, but we definitely have some items. I just, off the top of my head, don't know what they are. Um, this, this show lets me look at some of those things where I otherwise don't really have a reason to for my job. My job is focused on... Um, a lot of like social justice type work and uh, collections that would have relevance to the civil rights movement and beyond. So a lot of the stuff that I work with on a daily basis is from like the 1960s onward. Um, so getting to look at some of this older stuff for this show is actually uh, really fun for me because otherwise I don't really have a reason to do it. <laughs> Yeah, it's a big excuse for me to look at, at things that I would like to that I don't really have another reason to. <laughs> uh, yeah, Snorpel Bass, I'm, I'm looking. I just haven't found it yet. Um, he wrote a tale entitled The Thousand and Second Tale of Scheherazade and also The Murders in the Rue Morgue. Um, yeah, okay. I'm just, I'm working on it. <laughs> I found the Telltale Heart and the Pit and the Pendulum and the Black Cat and the spe Spectacles. There are 10 volumes, so I just, it, I'm looking at the uh, table of contents of them, so. <laughs> uh, purloined Letter. The Thousand and Second Tale of Scheherazade, The Cask of Amontillado. Um, so 
So I'll start with the cask of Amontillado. I will try and do Thousand and Second Tale of Scheherazade, and then I will look for the murders in the Rue Morgue. We may not get to them this week, though, Simsilica, but if we don't, I will definitely read them next. Read it next week. Because um, we do have all of next week to read more Edgar Allan Poe. Um, just one second while I make myself a note so I don't forget. And I have that. Wait, do I not have that? I had my Gmail open, but apparently. Lovely. OK, there we go. I just need to go into Google Keep and give myself a note. Um, the murders at the Rue Morgue. Tell heart. Yeah, OK. So we did Annabelle Lee. Let me go ahead and do uh, this, the Cask of Amontillado next. Scrap, I'm glad that you're enjoying the content I'm putting out. That means a lot to me. Because um, I enjoy doing this. Page 220 here, we get uh, the Cask of Amontillado. Just have to get to the page. The cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe. The thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as I best could, but when he ventured upon insult, I found I vowed ven. Bleh. Let me start that from the top. <clears throat> the cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe. The thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as best I could, but when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. You who so well know the nature of my soul will not suppose, however, that I gave utterance to a threat. At length I would be avenged. This was a point definitely settled, but the very definitiveness with which it was resolved precluded the idea of risk. I must not only punish, but punish with impunity. A wrong is unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt as such to him who has done the wrong. It must be understood that neither by word nor deed had I given Fortunato cause to doubt my good will. I continued, as was my wont, to smile in his face, and he did not perceive that my smile now was at the thought of his immolation. He had a weak point, this Fortunato, although in other regards he was a man to be respected and even feared. He prided himself on his connoisseurship of wine. Few Italians have the true virtuoso spirit. For the most part, their enthusiasm is adopted to suit the time and opportunity, to practice imposture upon the British and Aust Austrian millionaires. In painting and uh, gemmary, Fortunato, like his countrymen, was a quack, but in the matter of old wines, he was sincere. In this respect, I did not differ from him materially. I was skillful in the Italian vintages myself and bought largely whenever I could. I was about, it was about dusk one evening during the supreme madness of the carnival season that I encountered my friend. He accosted me with excessive warmth, for he had been drinking much. The man wore motley. He had on a tight-fitting, party-striped dress, and his head was surmounted by the conical cap and bells. I was so pleased to see him that I thought I should never have done wringing his, have done wringing his hand. I said to him, My dear Fortunato, you are luckily met. How remarkably well you are looking today, but I have received a pipe of what passes for a Montelado, and I have my doubts. How? said he, a montelado, a pipe, impossible, and in the middle of the carnival. I have my doubts, I replied, and I was silly enough to pay the full amontillado price without consulting you in the matter. You were not to be found, and I was fearful of losing a bargain. 
Amontillado. I have my doubts. Amontillado. And I must satisfy them. Amontillado. As you are engaged, I am on my way to Lucchesi. If any one has a critical turn, it is he. He will tell me. Lucchesi cannot tell Amontillado from Sherry. And yet some fools will have it that his taste is a match for your own. Come, let us go. Whither? To your vaults. My friend, no, I will not impose upon your good nature. I perceive you to have an engagement. Lucchesi, I have no engagement. Come. My friend, no, it is not the engagement, but the severe cold with which I perceive you are afflicted. The vaults are insufferably damp. They are encrusted with nitre. Let us go, nevertheless. The cold is merely nothing. Amontillado, you have been imposed upon. And as for Lucchesi, he cannot distinguish Sherry from Amontillado. Thus speaking, Fortunato possessed himself of my arm. Putting on a mask of black silk and drawing a roc uh, roclaire closely about my person, I suffered him to hurry to my palazzo. There were no attendants at home. They had absconded to make merry in honor of the time. I had told them that I should not return until the morning, and had given them explicit orders not to stir from the house. These orders were sufficient, I well knew, to ensure their immediate disappearance, one and all, as soon as my back was turned. I took from their sconces two flambeaux, and giving one to Fortunato, bowed him through several suites to the rooms uh, suites of rooms to the archway that led into the vaults. I passed down a long and winding staircase, requesting him to be cautious as he followed. We came at length to the foot of the descent and stood together on the damp ground of the catacombs of the Montresors. The gait of my friend was unsteady, and the bells upon his cap jingled as he strode. The pipe, said he, it is farther on, I, said I, but observe the white webwork which gleams from these cavern walls. He turned toward me and looked into my eyes with two flimsy orbs that distilled the room of intoxication. Nitre? he asked at length. Nitre, I replied. How long have you had that cough? My for poor friend found it impossible to reply for many minutes. It is nothing, he said at last. Come, I said with decision. We will go back. Your health is precious. You are rich, respected, admired, beloved. You are happy as once I was. You are a man to be missed. For me, it is no matter. We will go back. You will be ill, and I can't be Besides, there is Lucchesi. Enough, he said. The cough is a mere nothing. It will not kill me. I'm not certain what happened there, but hopefully I'm back. I'll take a sip of water to give it just a second. Enough, he said. The cough is a mere nothing. It will not kill me. I shall not die of a cough. True, true, I replied, and indeed I had no intention of alarming you unnecessarily, but you should use all proper caution. A draft of this, of this medoc will defend us from the damps. Here I knocked off the neck of a bottle which I knew, which I drew from a long row of its fellows that lay upon the mold. Drink, I said, presenting him the wine. He raised it to his lips with a leer. He paused and nodded to me familiarly while his bells jingled. I drink, he said, to the buried that repose around us, and I to, you, to your long life. He again took my arm, and we proceeded. These vaults, he said, are extensive. The Montresors, I replied, were a great and numerous family. I forget your arms. A huge human foot d'or in a field azure. The foot crushes a serpent rampant whose fangs are embedded in the heel. And the motto? Nemo mi impune la quesit. Good, he said. The wine sparkled in his eyes and the bells jingled. My own fancy grew warm with the medoc. We had passed through walls of piled bones with casks and puncheons intermingling into the inmost recesses of the catacombs. I paused again, and this time I made bold to, si to seize Fortunato by an arm above the elbow. 
The nitre, I said. See, it increases. It hangs like moss upon the walls. We are below the river's bed. The drops of moisture trickle among the bones. Come, we will go back ere it is too late. Your cough. It is nothing, he said. Let us go on. But first another draught of the medoc. I broke and reached him a flagon of de Grave. He emptied it in a breath. His eyes flashed with a fierce light. He laughed and threw the bottle upward with a gesticulation I did not understand. I looked at him in surprise. He repeated the movement, a grotesque one. You do not comprehend, he said. Not I, I replied. Then you are not of the Brotherhood. How? You are not of the Masons. Yes, yes, I said. Yes, yes. You? Impossible. A Mason? A mason, I replied. A sign, he said. It is this, I answered, producing a trowel from beneath the folds of my roclair. You jest, he exclaimed, recoiling a few paces, but let us proceed to the amontillado. Be it so, I said, replacing the tool beneath the cloak and again offering him my arm. He leaned upon it heavily. We continued our route in search of the amontillado. We passed through a range of low arches, descended, passed on, and descended again, arrived at a deep crypt in which the foulness of the air caused our flambeau rather to glow, to glow than flame. At the most remote end of the crypt, there appeared another less spacious. Its walls had been lined with human remains piled to the vault overhead in the fashion of the great catacombs of Paris. Three sides of this interior crypt were still or ornamented in this manner. From the fourth, the bones had been thrown down and lay promiscu promiscuously upon the earth, forming at one point a mound of some size. Within the wall thus exposed by the displacing of the bones, we perceived a still interior recess, in depth about four feet, in width three, in height six or seven. <clears throat> it seemed to have been constructed for no especial use within itself, but formed merely the interval between two of the colossal supports of the roof of the catacombs, and was backed by one of their circumscribing walls of solid granite. It was in vain that Fortunato, uplifting his dull torch, endeavored to pry into the depth of the recess. Its termination the feeble light did not enable us to see. Proceed, I said, herein is the amontillado. As for Lucchesi, he is an ignoramus, interrupted my friend as he stepped unsteadily forward, while I followed immediately at his heels. In an instant he had reached the extremity of the niche, and finding his progress arrested by the rock, stood stupidly bewildered. A moment more, and I had fettered him to the granite. In its surface were two iron staples, distant from each other about two feet horizontally. From one of these depended a short chain, from the other a padlock. Throwing the links about his waist, it was but, but the work of a few seconds to secure it. He was too much astounded to resist. Withdrawing the key, I stepped back from the recess. Pass your hand, I said, over the wall. You cannot help feeling the niter. Indeed, it is very damp. Once more, let me implore you to return. No? Then I must positively leave you. But I must first render you all the little attentions in my power. The Amontillado! ejaculated my friend, not yet recovered from his astonishment. True, I replied. The Amontillado. As I said these words, I busied myself among the pile of bones of which I have before spoken. Throwing them aside, I soon uncovered a quantity of building stone and mortar. With these materials and with the aid of my trowel, I began vigorously to wall up the entrance of the niche. I had scarcely laid the first tier of masonry when I discovered that the intoxication of Fortunato had in a great measure worn off. The earliest indication I had of this was a low moaning cry from the depth of the recess. I, it was not the cry of a drunken man. There was then a long and obstinate silence. I laid the second tier, and the third, and the fourth, and then I heard the furious vibrations of the chain. The noise lasted for several minutes, during which, that I might hearken to it with more satisfaction, I ceased my labors and sat down upon the bones. When at last the clanking subsided, I resumed the trowel and finished without interruption the fifth, the fifth, the sixth, 
and seventh tier. The wall was now nearly upon a level with my breast. I again paused, holding the flambeau over the mason work, threw a few feeble rays upon the figure within. A succession of loud and shrill screams bursting suddenly from the throat of the chained form seemed to thrust me violently back. For a brief moment, I hesitated. I trembled. Unsheathing my rapier, I began to grope with it about the recess, but, I th but the thought of an instant reassured me. I placed my hand upon the solid fabric of the catacombs and felt satisfied. I reapproached the wall. I re replied to the yells of him who clamored. I re-echoed. I aided. I surpassed them in volume and in strength. I did this, and the clamor grew still. It was now midnight, and my task was drawing to a close. I had completed the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth tier. I had finished a portion of the last and the eleventh. There remained but a single stone to be fitted and plastered in. I struggled with its weight. I placed it partially in its, intended, or in its destined position. But now there came from out the niche a low laugh that erected the hairs upon my head. It was succeeded by a sad voice which I had difficulty in recognizing at that, as that of the noble Fortunato. The voice said, <laughs> A very good joke indeed, an excellent jest. We will have many a rich laugh about it in the palazzo <laughs> over our wine. <laughs> the Amontillado, I said. <laughs> yes, the Amontillado. But is it not getting late? Will not they be awaiting us at the palazzo, the Lady Fortunato and the rest? Let us be gone. Yes, I said, let us be gone. For the love of God, Montresor. Yes, I said, for the love of God. But to these words I hearkened in vain for a reply. I grew impatient. I called out aloud, Fortunato. No answer. I called again, Fortunato. No answer still. I thrust a torch through the remaining aperture and let it fall within. There came forth in return only a jingling of the bells. My heart grew sick on account of the dampness of the catacombs. I hastened to make an end of my labor. I forced the last stone into its position. I plastered it up. Against the new masonry, I re-erected the old rampart of bones. For the half of a century, no mortal has disturbed them. In patre requiescat. The end. <laughs> yeah, Scruff, I, I really like the composition of the, the prose here. Um, all right, I'm scrolling back to see the commentary. Virtuoso is an Italian word, yes. A pipe of wine is a large, lengthy barrel or cask with tapered ends. I did not know that, Hannah. Thank you for that information. For today's amusing linguistic quirks, I quote Wikipedia. The butt, from the medieval French and Italian botte, or pipe, was half a, half a ton, or 1,008 pints, or 126 gallons. That would be a lot of amontillado. Uh, yeah, a lot of wine. Yes, Simsilica, he is indeed a mason. Wink, wink. Uh, meaning not a member of a secret brotherhood, but somebody who was definitely doing some stonework. Yes. Yes, uh, Fortunato was talking Freemasons, and, and Montresor was mocking him in more, way than, more ways than one. <laughs> Poe has a thing for burying people in walls or under floors. A flambeau is basically a flat disc-shaped torch, usually crafted, carried on the end of a tapered thin stick. Yes, or on chains. Yeah, it's like a little, like a little metal disc that is, if I'm remembering correctly, uh,
yeah, it's kind of like a little, a, a little cup torch that can be on a stick or held from chains. So it could be a flat disc, or it could be a, a shallow bowl. It could also be more of like a, a little cup that holds a fuel um, that burns. But yeah. Uh, you remembered more of the story than you thought you would. No, he's not going to steal the Declaration of Independence. Um, this one might be interesting to do next week, the Domain of Arnhem, since this is the Arnhem edition. Uh, but we are out of time for today, so let me jot down in my notes everything that was requested today from, from Poe so that I can get to it next week. Um, one of them was in here, Telltale Heart. I have that one on my list. Uh, the Murders at the Rue Morgue. Um, what was the other one in here? The Thousand and Second Tale of Scheherazade. There was one more. that somebody brought up. Telltale Heart. Cask of Amontillado. I don't know, but we can always, if somebody remembers, uh, I've got the murders in the Rue Morgue on my list. Um, so noted to definitely get to next week, I have the murders at the Rue, Rue Morgue, the Telltale Heart, and the Thousand and Second Tale of Scheherazade. Um, if there are others that people want me to read next week, you can throw them out now, or um, you can also request them next week. Um, yeah, Scruff, I'm, I'm happy to include those in future. Uh, so I will work to do that. Uh, this month has all been um, kind of Halloween themed. So... That's why we have the Poe. Um, and I haven't decided particularly on stuff for next week, uh, or not next week, for next month. I haven't decided. I was thinking that I might do, um, so we'll definitely be missing at least one Wednesday next month, because next month is when American Thanksgiving happens, um, and the university closes down on Wednesday before this program starts. So I will not be able to stream that day because uh, the building will be locked. Um, <laughs> so we'll miss at least one next month. Um, and then in December, we'll miss a couple because um, there is a period of, the, of time when the university is completely closed. Uh, and, and so it's like a right between um, the... Christmas holiday and the New Year's holiday, the university is completely closed. Um, and aside from some few residential services people and international students, um, basically nobody is on campus. Uh, we're all furloughed in a sense. We, but so I can't come in and, and stream during that period. But otherwise, um, I was thinking next month I may try to do some um, uh, at least one episode on harvest festivals because uh, we have the cooking collection and so cookbooks and other resources related to things like Thanksgiving, harvest festivals. Um, so I may try to do something like that, but I can definitely pull out, especially as we approach into the sort of uh, midwinter festival season, um, some Im illuminated manuscripts or other things related to that time of year. I've sort of been doing that this year where we approach certain times and I'm trying to do something on theme, which is why we're doing um, scary stuff in, in this time near Halloween um, as we approach. Uh, I don't really have a lot for Hanukkah. I can look though and see what I've got. Um, and as far as like 
Christmas, I know I've got a couple of illustrated, uh, like drawn Christmas cards that were designed by uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's daughter, who was an architect herself. Um, so I can definitely share those, but I will look for some illuminated manuscripts and other things like that. <laughs> I don't know why you're singing the Star Spangled Banner in chat, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> for Thanksgiving? Oh, American Thanksgiving, gotcha. I say American Thanksgiving because Canadian Thanksgiving was uh, like last week or the week before. Um, so yeah. Anyway, uh, that is going to be the end of the stream today. Um, yes, yes, Hannah, I am wearing Not the Brave um, <laughs> today. I. If you haven't noticed, I typically have one of the Critical Role chibi pins on when I do this show. Um, so, you yeah, know, uh, let me see who is streaming right now. Um, so the aquarium is on today and they are doing their sea otter cam. So I think that is where we will head. Yeah, Crafty Becky, I am excited for it too. Um, they are quite good and yeah. Um, and Hannah, yes, um, so I will, I will take more requests. We may just focus on Poe next week and just have an entire stream of, of uh, reading Edgar Allan Poe. Um, uh, but I will prioritize lesser known ones first and save the best known ones for last so that we're sharing new things. But if we run out of requests, then I'll read the stuff that people already know. But yeah, we are going to raid the um, Monterey Bay Aquarium. Oh, hi, uh, E. Loredan. You came here with Eric's raid, just wanted to say hi and thank you. Very stormy evening here, so this perfect vibe and very enjoyable. I'm glad you enjoyed it, E. Loredan. I am here 2.30 um, p.m. Eastern time uh, every Wednesday sharing things from the archives. Um, so it, it's somewhat regular that Eric ends up raiding, um, but I'm live following his stream weekly. Um, and you're welcome anytime. I'm glad you enjoyed it. So, um, yeah, I am going to set up the raid, though, because I do have to, I have to get going because I have to close up for the day. Um, okay, come on. There we go. So we are raiding the Monterey Bay Aquarium for, uh, they have their sea otter cam right now. Um, I hope you enjoy that calming vibe to follow on the Edgar Allan Poe of today. And yeah, I think next week we are just going to focus on Edgar Allan Poe. Um, I may throw a couple of other authors in there as options if you want to request them, but we've got plenty to cover with just the Poe. Uh, and until next week, I hope that you um, all stay safe and have a lovely week. Uh, I hope I will see you back here again um, next Wednesday. <laughs>